So the, the idea now is that, uh, and to be a little bit more specific about this uh, decoder model, is that we, let's say we have our observations are continuous, so each element in X is a continuous number, then we can model this with a Gaussian distribution and our we use neural networks or a neural network with some shared weights to describe the mean of, of this distribution and the variance. And this will depend on the specific value of the mean and variance will depend on the specific uh, value of the latent variable. So our neural networks is now used as a mapping from C to a mean value and a variance value like this. Then we also need a decoder and I'll show you uh, very soon why, but we can represent them in the same fashion as um, a mapping from the input to a mean and a variance for C. And you can see that our uh, decoder has parameters theta and our encoder has parameters uh, phi. And these are two uh, different neural networks. So there are no, there's no uh, here, right here, there's no uh, parameter sharing between the two. So we want, actually, we want to uh, to maximize the log likelihood, uh, and here comes the beautiful thing about uh, where we can use variational uh, the variational approach because we can write a lower bound on the likelihood, and this lower bound is still an integral over c, but it's an integral that it turns out is much easier to evaluate than the original integral. And this uh, variational bound is written here for one single example in red, and you can see it involves an average of the encoder distribution over the encoder distribution of the log between the joint distribution of X and C from the generative model and then divided by this uh, encoder uh, function here. And we can decompose the log into two terms and now you can try to uh, start to understand how this uh, approach why this approach actually works really nicely and and it makes uh, a lot of sense also uh, regarding what we have learned earlier about the need for regularization to avoid the identity mapping because the first term here is the expected value over the q distribution or the encoder distribution of the log likelihood right so this is a data fit term so that that essentially me uh, measures how well does, uh, uh, on average, does can we reproduce the observations. So if we do a good fit to the data, this first term will be large. But then we also have a second term, which is a regularization term, and you can see it has the log of the prior distribution over um, or the latent space divided by the posterior, the variational posterior distribution the encoder, variational posterior distribution, and you can see uh, we we know uh, from this is like a KL uh, divergence between Q and the and the prior, and we know that that is minimum when when the prior and uh, when the posterior Q is equal to the prior. So this term will actually try to squeeze uh, the uh, this Q distribution towards the prior distribution. And if it does that, then it has not learned anything about the data. So optimizing the variational uh, bound is, is a trade-off between fitting the data and then getting closer to the prior manifold, this simple normally distributed manifold. Yes. So I said that this integral, uh, the second integral, uh, with the, the variational integral is, is more well behaved. It is more well behaved because we have log and we can also apply the so-called uh, repromisization trick. And this is a very simple trick that is useful once we want to make uh, uh, stochastic gradient descent optimization of, uh, in this case, this bound. Because we can now write C, instead of using C as a variable, we can use an epsilon sorry, instead of using C as the stochastic variable, we can use an epsilon, which is simply a normally distributed variable with zero mean and unit variance. So it has no parameters. We have then uh, replaced all occurrences in the integral by uh, this deterministic mean function times the standard deviation times this 
noise we draw from this simple uh, distribution, normal distribution without any uh, parameters. And instead of having the integral, we, re we replace that by a sample where we in this uh, expression here have drawn uh, uh, R samples. Usually we set R equal to 1 in order to get the optimal trade-off between speed and, and, uh, and accuracy. Sometimes it can be a good idea at the end of your optimization to increase R, but usually we just use R equal to 1 uh, most of the time. So now we have a bound for one example, and then we, of course, should say the, the our likelihood bound is the sum over this for all the ex examples, and we can now take derivatives of this bound with respect to theta and phi in order to, at, at the same time, uh, optimize the likelihood, uh, make the probability of the observed data as large as possible when we optimize the model, the generative model with parameters theta, and also make the bound as tight as possible by uh, optimizing with respect to the variational distribution. The variational distribution is of course limited in the way that you can see, if I go back a little bit, that we have taken a quite simple distribution, we've taken a normal distribution, that's probably an okay idea because um, because if we have a lot of a lot of data it will be it would be a quite uh, it would be kind of uh, asymptotically it will be a normal distribution but we have ignored uh, covariances between the different latent variables because we have a diagonal covariance uh, matrix so we model each element of each uh, uh, of the variance of each component but we don't model the covariance between the variables and actually in, in, in my research group we have worked on ways to go beyond this with the use of auxiliary variables and I will show you some benchmark results where we actually uh, have quite nice uh, benchmark results for introducing uh, uh, this auxiliary variable to to make a more complicated variational distributions but that's a little bit beyond, beyond the aim of, of uh, this lecture. So why do we call this an autoencoder? Uh, you can see that by, by the fact that this is actually also a model that has both an encoder and a decoder. So it maps in the encoder. The encoder is, is, is uh, stochastic because we then have a stochastic mapping from the x to some latent variable c. So the stochastic comes in this epsilon drawn from a zero one normal and then the decoder uh, maps back and then we allow us to compute the density, the conditional density of our obser observation x uh, for this data point. Yes, and now comes uh, maybe the climax, I don't know, uh, that we can actually say, see that uh, how this image has been generated more or less because once we have learned uh, the parameters, the theta and the phi, then we can now just draw from our latent manifold C, just draw this uh, zero one uh, normal, multidimensional, uh, uh, there should be an identity instead of one in the slide. And then we can pass that through our feed forward neural networks for the mean and the variance, and then we can draw and x from that. So you can see this is how we actually generated these examples. And and despite that we actually don't model uh, covariances between the different x's, you can see we actually we actually draw some pretty convincing uh, digits um, with sim similar statistics as as the real MNIST digits. Yes. So this was the basic introduction to uh, variational autoencoders. In the remainder of <clears throat> my lecture, I will talk about how we can use this for semi-supervised learning.